Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'm very happy to present the last lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the urinary system. And we're going to talk about neoplasms in the urinary tract. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me these fantastic images, which allow me to put these lectures together. You know, it seems that metastatic tumors are probably more common in the kidney than primary tumors. And probably the most common, if we look across species, is going to be lymphoma. We've talked about lymphoma earlier on as a differential for white nodules and the kidney. And they tend to run toward the larger side. They don't track vessels like we see with uh, feline infectious peritonitis or mutated feline coronavirus infection. And if I'm presented with something like this that almost effaces the entire kidney, I'm going to have to go with lymphoma first. It is not an uncommon finding. Uh, in cats with lymphoma that it's in the kidney. One species that seems to always have it, if it has any lymphoma, it's always in the kidney, is the rabbit in my particular experience. But you can see it in any species. There's a beautiful picture by Lonnie Schumacher of lymphoma in the uh, uh, cortex of a cow kidney. And another picture, a cross section, where it's primarily restricted to the medulla in this picture by Pepe Ramos Vera. Um, and you can see that it has obstructed the outflow of the kidney because we can see these dilated calyces all along the kidney. It is also the most common renal tumor in goats with a fairly recent paper uh, published by Dr. Christiane Lohr of Oregon State University where she took a retrospective look at 102 tumors in goats and 17 of those tumors turned out to be lymphomas. Most common location was lymph node, then spleen, liver, and then kidney runs a fourth. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here in these tubules. They look a little odd to me though. Well, if we look at the uh, another very common, at least in, in dogs, very common metastatic tumor in the kidney, uh, it's a beautiful picture here by Paul Stromberg of a large hemangiosarcoma, uh, which effaces about half of this kidney. And if you look really closely, you'll see two other lesions. One that jumps out at you is the dilation of the renal pelvis uh, and the calyces up here. This is uh, hydronephrosis. And you have to look a little closer for the last one, but you look at the roof of this dilated renal crest and you see this greenish area surrounded by hemorrhage. So we have ongoing uh, renal papillary necrosis as well. Hemangiosarcomas can pop up in any organ. They don't care because all organs have uh, blood vessels in them and they usually arise from the, uh, the blood vessels for one reason or another in the dog. A uh, kidney wouldn't be at the top of my list if I was going to guess where he, uh, a dog was developing a hemangiosarcoma. My three main uh, rule outs and the three most common places in the dog are the right atrium, the liver, and the spleen. But as I said before, you can see it absolutely anywhere. Okay, if we look at the primary neoplasms of the kidney, they're really not all that common. Uh, they're probably more commonly seen in horses and cattle than in other species. And usually they're incidental autopsy findings. They're often clinically silent. They usually arise from the cells of the proximal convoluted tubules. And uh, in certain species like cats, they seem to have a predilection for the poles of the kidney. They can be very large, but they're still fairly benign. It's often difficult under the microscope to tell the difference between a benign neoplasm and a malignant one based on the cellular morphology. Uh, obviously, you want to take it in the context of the growth, the amount of necrosis, uh, mitotic rate is usually fairly low, and metastasis is probably the be all and end all of uh, renal tubular tumors uh, in animal species. Here's one in, uh, in a horse, where here in the right kidney, you have a well demarcated uh, nodule. Um, they also get a lot of renal adenomas, as do cattle at slaughter. As I said before, they're usually incidental findings. 
and we're looking at the uh, a dog kidney here and this one is a lot larger um, the malignant tumors often have a lot of necrosis in it. They can be very difficult to differentiate from metastatic tumors from other sites, uh, such as the adrenal cortex. And we've had very good luck here at the JPC with PAX-8 as a marker for tubular epithelium. So that's one of our favorites. Um, in the dog, they can metastasize to a variety of organs, the lungs, the liver, the nodes, and the adrenal. It's an interesting tumor that arises for a number of reasons. In frogs, it's virally induced. Uh, in rats and probably most other species, there are well-documented uh, genetic mutations. They are not always, they're usually uh, fairly silent, but they're not always uh, silent. And they may elaborate some of the compounds that your normal tubular epithelium elaborates. So uh, animals with this can rarely have uh, they can liberate erythropoietin and result in uh, high levels and increased hematocrit. Um, I also want to mention that in the dog, there are three types. They're papillary, they're tubular, and solid. And then there's a, a fourth variant, which is cystic. And, and these cystic renal uh, carcinomas are often associated in German Shepherd breeds with two other findings. Uh, dermal f areas of dermal fibrosis, nodular dermal fibrosis on the legs, and in the female they may be associated with tumors of the uterine wall. So when we've seen a number of those come through, they're, they're not always associated with that, but it's one of those things if I see multifocal areas of dermal fibrosis on the legs, and that's multiple ones, not just one because that's a common surgical pathology finding. If I see multiple ones, and it's a German Shepherd, I'm going to ask that, uh, that clinician to go back and image the kidneys, and we picked up a couple that way. Here is an uncommon neoplasm. I think it's a lot more common than we know or that we look at. We don't look at it very much anymore. It's usually seen in the uh, uh, cortical medullary junction. People have uh, mistakenly called them renal fibromas, but these are uh, renal interstitial cell tumors. And the interstitial cells are a very thin cell. It looks very much like a fibroblast that produces the prostaglandins that you need to keep those wimpy vasa recta uh, open. And if you look at them at very high magnification or <clears throat> preferably with electron microscope, you'll notice that these particular long, thin cells have abundant smooth endoplasmic reticulum and fat in their cytoplasm, which you don't see in the normal fibroblast because they're using that uh, to make steroids, make those prostaglandins keep things open, but they're almost always seen right at the corticomedullary junction. Uh, let's move to the bladder. Um, what can I say? We have a very large uh, exophytic mass, um, which is occluding most of the lumen here. When we talk about uh, dogs and cats, we want to think about transitional cell carcinoma. Uh, these neoplasms had a predilection for rising at the trigome, um, which is where the ureters come in. They can cause obstruction and, and compensatory uh, hydronephrosis of the kidney. They do a whole lot of things. They can just grow out into the lumen. They can grow into the wall, so you can have invasive forms. You can have papillary forms. We've talked before that they can arise in areas of polypoid cystitis following chronic inflammation. Um, really, in the dog, the, uh, the bladder is not the most common location for this particular tumor. Uh, it's most commonly seen in male dogs in the intraprostatic urethra, and a lot of uh, tumors of the prostate are actually urethelial tumors coming out of the prostatic urethra, but because they do have, they often have a high component of signet ring cells, uh, people who are just starting out might, might think that they uh, are prostatic uh, neoplasms. Prostatic neoplasms are, are very, very uncommon, but a transitional cell carcinoma is extremely common. You can see them anywhere 
in the urinary tract. It could be anywhere from the renal pelvis, which is the first place we have the urethelium, down to the distal urethra. And in, uh, uh, in laboratory beagles, they have been shown, especially in the female ones, to arise in multiple locations in the ureters and urethra. These things love to metastasize. They usually go to the regional lymph nodes adjacent to the aortic bifurcation. Um, they may rarely metastasize. So they'll go to the sublumbar lymph nodes. They meta may metastasize to the vertebra. And a recent paper has shown that they not uncommonly will metastasize to the skin of the perineum and the hind legs. Uh, if left to their own devices, about 50 percent of these will metastasize, but none of them are good to have because they are space-occupying hemorrhagic lesions and, and just never a good thing. I mentioned yesterday, and I didn't have a good picture, and I just pulled a great picture by Dave Garlick, um, of the lesion that happens when you have over distension, prolonged over distension of the bladder, whether it's a cat with that's obstructed or it's a dog with a, uh, a tumor in the, in the trigone, which prevents urinary outflow. But you get this very classic venous infarct of the, uh, the very anterior portion of the urinary bladder of the fundus, and that arises from the distension the massive distension of this bladder, which will cause stretching and occlusion of the lumen in the veins, uh, which drain uh, the blood from the bladder, and it's most pronounced in the anterior end, so you often will get these venous infarcts. Absolutely beautiful lesion, which tells you this animal has been obstructed and massively instructed for a period of time. Now this is a great picture of a neoplasm that's seen in large breed dogs younger than 18 months. And it is known as the botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma. The only thing I don't like about this picture is it's in the wrong spot. These particular neoplasms, unlike uh, transitional cell carcinomas which arise in the trigone near the outflow, uh, the botryoid rhabdomyosarcomas actually more commonly arise in the fundus, in the anterior portion of the bladder. Uh, the reason that they get, there are a number of, of forms of rhabdomyosarcoma, um, and the reason that they're called botryoid is the fact that whoever looked at them first or named them said it looks like a bunch of grapes, um, and this one particularly do, does. They often will, will turn up on the dorsal wall of the fundus, and they're thought to arise from the embryonal myoblasts of the urogenital ridge. These will also metastasize to uh, regional lymph nodes, and they're characterized by their appearance uh, as well as their predilection to be seen in large breed young dogs. Well, we're running out of things to say about tumors of the, uh, of the tract, of the urinary system. Um, actually, let's pop back to the kidney for our last tumor. We have a a well-encapsulated neoplasm in the, uh, in the renal cortex. And this is a common tumor, or the most common primary tumor, in a number of species, including chickens and swine and rabbits. And it's probably the second most common in most of the other species. And this is a nephroblastoma. Nephroblastomas arise from a very primitive primordial cell. They often arise at one pole of the kidney. They're almost always unilateral. Um, they are a much more, fen, uh, more fun uh, microscopic diagnosis than a gross uh, diagnosis, but it's fairly rewarding to see one of these in, in a, a species that's predisposed, and then you can go down and you can see one of a number of features, uh, including fetal glomeruli, primitive mesenchyme, um, and all of the other features that will be listed for you in, uh, uh, in VISPO. In rodents, they have been fairly commonly uh, uh, caused by the induction with a number of potent carcinogenic compounds like uh, ethyl nitrosourea 
and all of that. In the rabbit, they, the rabbit model, they tend to uh, uh, metastasize and, and share a lot of important characteristics with their human counterparts. The uh, uh, Wilms tumor uh, immunohistochemical marker is always a good one to run on these. I think it's key to remember that not all of them have all of the, the key components. You'll find some that are primarily uh, undifferentiated mesenchyme, some that may have a lot of uh, fetal glomeruli um, or, or tumors that, that still resemble paramesonephric tubules. Um, but you don't have to have all five of the described components to make your diagnosis of nephroblastoma. A lot of the ones I've seen may have three or sometimes four, but they rarely uh, read VISPO in the, the various textbooks. And this brings us to the end of the uh, gross pathology of the urinary system. The uh, kidney is something that is an amazing organ. There's a lot of variation uh, uh, histologically in terms of the various diseases, so we've only really scratched the surface with these gross lectures. Um, with that, I want to thank you for the attention you've given to this lecture and any of the other lectures that I have given in this or any other system. Please feel free to come back to wherever you view these, whether if you're watching them on Facebook, you're watching them on the Foundation's YouTube channel, which has not only these lectures, but just a great variety um, of lectures from you know really uh, outstanding teachers and scientists in our profession we are adding uh, we're adding new videos literally multiple each week so there's always something good to watch there um, with that as always I wish you good luck good health tremendous happiness we have a holiday week on us now so I hope that you will be safe. Um, it is much better to spend Thanksgiving on Zoom than Christmas in the hospital. So uh, uh, be wise, be safe, and I'll see you again.